Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to yet more Warhammer 40k lore. And today, we're going to be talking about Tau Drones, because I've got a somewhat spicy take on the Tau Drones coming up, but before we get to that, I actually have to tell you what Tau Drones are to avoid any future confusion. So, Tau Drones, let's get into it. First and foremost, what is a drone? Well, in our conventional wisdom, a drone is an unmanned aircraft, either guided by onboard computer systems, GPS, sensors, etc., or controlled from a remote location. In the case of Tau drones, this is not an entirely accurate definition, but it's close enough for government work, with the primary difference being that the Tau drone has a fairly advanced onboard AI. Now, of course, it being fairly advanced doesn't necessarily mean that it is in and of itself intelligent. It just means that it's far beyond anything the Imperium could make, or hell, anything that we today could make. Although it is still a very rudimentary AI. Basically, the limits of its operations would be things like, oh, I'm alone, I should run away, or there's a bad guy over there, I should shoot at him, or that's a friendly over there, I probably shouldn't shoot at that. And whilst that might sound quite rudimentary, You'd be surprised, because machines are incredibly dumb, and you tend to have to tell them absolutely every teensy itsy bitsy little thing that they're actually supposed to be doing, but we'll get to that near the end of the video where we're actually going to talk about the artificial intelligence part of the drone. For now, let's first explore what exactly the drones do in the Tau Mini Empire. Which is a remarkably broad question, because the Tau use them for practically goddamn everything these days. They're shield generators, they're snipers, they're soldiers, they're fire support, they're communications relays, they're sentry turrets, they're infiltrators, they deliver fucking pizza, yes really, and they build houses. There's not really anything they aren't doing at the moment. And this remarkable versatility is all due to the incredible feat of Earthcast engineering that is its brain. Since the drone is not purely limited to the tasks it has been pre-programmed to carry out. Whilst it is of course equipped with a set of programming that allows it to carry out the tasks it has been designated to carry out, it is also able to receive instructions to carry out simple tasks by its operators. This means that it is far beyond a simple artificial intelligence, since you can literally tell it to do something that it has not been specifically programmed to do, and it will actually be able to figure out not only what you want it to do based on verbal or written command, but it is also able to creatively come up with a solution on how it is actually going to do what you ordered it to do. The drone intelligence is often described as simple, like that of a small animal, but this would put it far beyond the remits of a small animal. To put it into perspective, let's take the example of a dog, which is not really a small animal, but you get the general idea. A dog is a fairly intelligent creature, you know, relatively speaking, and it can, after training, depending on the breed and some other factors, be taught to carry out simple tasks. However, a drone does not actually have to be taught how to carry out these tasks. It will be able to figure out how to carry out these tasks by itself. This would be the equivalent of getting a brand new dog with absolutely no training and telling it to go fetch the newspaper and the dog actually goes to fetch the newspaper. The thing is, of course, the dog has absolutely no idea what a newspaper is. It doesn't even have a concept of what a newspaper is. Hell, the dog barely understands fetch as a concept, and so being able to simply tell the dog to go fetch the newspaper, and having the dog actually do so, would be beyond remarkable. It would be hands down the smartest dog to have ever lived, for it to sit there and figure out the concept of newspaper and accurately identify it. Now, of course, there are very clear differences between a biological brain and a mechanical brain. The drone can be pre-programmed with a vast quantity of different concepts, allowing it to identify a newspaper simply just by essentially searching the word newspaper. However, 
this would still mean that its intelligence, being able to figure out what it is, even if it is from a database, would pull it far, far above that of a mere animal. In fact, it would be considerably closer to that of a young child. In so far as being unable to solve a complex riddle or a puzzle, mayhaps, but also being able to make logical inferences based on existing knowledge. If anything, the idea of the drones being small animals has more to do with their status in Tao society, as the owners of a drone often treat it essentially as a favoured pet, and it may even be the case that the drones have been specifically engineered to coax out this response. In other words, they have been engineered to behave cute, to behave like a pet, and to try and create a bond between themselves and their masters. Immediately, two explanations strike me as logical for this. The first, and probably the most likely, is that living creatures do have a habit of anthropomorphizing things. We humans in particular are very, very good at anthropomorphizing things, to the point that reading a certain internet story can have you feeling genuinely bad for an old hard drive you used to own. And whilst of course the Tao are not human, their society does have certain similarities with our own, so I don't think it'd be too much of a leap of logic to say that that could be the case, that they are simply just anthropomorphizing the drones and attributing traits to them that they may not necessarily possess. There is of course also a second, somewhat darker explanation. The Tao, and the Ethereals in particular, are extraordinarily fond of social engineering, so I certainly wouldn't think it beyond them to create the drones in such a way as to elicit a sympathetic response, or even possibly using their near total control over Tao society to make them react in such a way. The benefits of this are of course quite obvious. If the Tao are very fond of their drones, they are going to take far better care of their drones, and seeing as practically all of Tower society uses drones in one way or another, again all the way from construction to delivery work to warfare etc etc etc, then it would only make sense to encourage Tower society to take extra good care of the drones upon which they rely. Though bear in mind that this does not in any way mean that the drones are of any sort of equal standing to the Tau. The Tau will try to take care of the drones, but a drone is clearly more expendable than a Tau. Therefore, the drones are programmed to literally sacrifice themselves if doing so could possibly save the life of a Tau. For example, in a firefight, it could throw itself in front of a grenade to protect its Tau master. As mentioned previously, drones do have a self-preservation protocol and will flee the battlefield, but they will only do so if there are no more Tau nearby to protect. And speaking of their ability to provide protection, the Tau gun drone is actually a rather ferocious little fuck. It might not be particularly large, the average drone being about the size of a fire warrior's torso, which is already a little bit smaller than a human, but it can be equipped with a wide variety of equipment, both offensive, defensive, and logistical slash communicative in nature. So let's start with the quote unquote simplest of these roles, the offensive one, seeing as in this case all you really need to do is strap some guns to the drone. Although, once again, the Tau tend to go a little bit crazy when it comes to the sheer array of options they strap to their drones. That is the basic gun drone, for example, that usually accompany fire warrior squads, as well as being mounted on devilfish and piranha IFVs. These usually come with a twin-linked set of pulse carbines, and can operate either as direct support, as mentioned, for piranhas or devilfish, or as direct support for fire warrior squads. Then there is also the heavy gun drone, which fulfills the exact same purpose, except it switches out the two carbines for something considerably heftier, like for example a pair of twin-linked burst cannons. But of course, their weaponry is not entirely limited to good old-fashioned shooty stuff. There is also missile drones, there's shielded drones, there are marker light drones, which are used to guide in homing missiles, 
and by extension there are also drones equipped with said homing missiles, ready to deploy them once a marker light has been activated, therefore locking it onto a target. Hell, there are even sniper drones, although these usually require a fair bit more in the way of direct control rather than most drones, meaning that a sniper drone team will usually have a drone operator guiding them from somewhere relatively close by, yet also, hopefully, for the tower at least, relatively safe. As you may have noticed, most of these roles are supporting in nature. There are occasions in which the tower deploy their drones in larger formations so that they can link with one another and therefore become smarter, in which case they can act in a frontline combat unit role, but generally speaking the tower prefer to use them relatively close to tower operators, so that the operators can make the important decisions and guide the drones towards the task at which they would be most effective. So generally speaking, they fulfill something along the same roles as a heavy weapon squad might do in an Imperial Guard formation. This is perhaps best exemplified with the basic gun drone. Its role in a firefight once attached to a fire warrior squad is to provide suppressing fire and a distraction. A few gun drones will pop up and out of terrain in and out of cover using their grav engines and heightened mobility along with their rapid firing pulse carbines to hose down the enemy's position with gunfire whilst also frustrating any attempts from the unit to return fire since they are so very very nippy and mobile. They will, ideally, take up pretty much all of the attention of the squad they're firing on, so that the fire warriors can flank around the enemy and take them from the sides and or rear. In a grander sense, squadrons of drones can also be used in much the same manner on a larger scale. You could, for example, have two or three full squadrons of gun drones, a couple of heavy gun drones, and maybe even some missile drones mixed in, so you have a decent mix of light weapon fire, heavy weapons fire, and anti-tank. To engage a formation's front line whilst the fire warriors mounted in devilfish IFVs flank around them whilst supported by light skimmers like the Piranha. This tactic does however leave the gun drones without direct fire warrior support, which means they are left without direct input, which in turn, again, means that they will react fairly slowly, relatively speaking, to rapidly changing circumstances on the battlefield. So this tactic is best utilized against enemies that are willing to just sit there and trade fire with the Tau, whilst against orcs or Tyranids or Space Marines, you know, somewhat aggressive factions, it is likely to backfire rather drastically. There is also another offensive role that primarily utilizes drones, which is a rather fascinating one, and that is aerial supremacy. They are used both as aerial drone mines, where a drone will literally patrol an area, and once it picks up an enemy aircraft, it will then boost itself towards it with the intention of ramming and detonating against the aircraft. There are also chaff drones, which act as active countermeasures that will try and confuse incoming missiles guidance systems by blasting them with electrical pulses or even just flat out ramming the missile in question to protect their mothership. There are also interceptor drones which do just that. They are dropped from the Sunshark bomber and used to engage any aircraft that try to shoot down the Sunshark. This, in all your essentiality, means that the Tau Bomber is constantly carrying around with it two intercept fighters to protect it, which is pretty goddamn valuable. Of course, these are drone intelligence fighters and such, they're going to struggle to deal with any really competent pilots, but still, that is still two interceptors that the fighter has to deal with before re-engaging the Sunshark, at which point the Sunshark has in all due likelihood already dropped its payload and is bugging the fuck out. There is also yet another variation on this particular type of fighter, that is the DX-6 Remora Drone Stealth Fighter. This tries to make up for the relatively low intelligence of the individual drone by giving it the most vital of all advantages in aerial combat, the element of surprise. And of course, the logic here is quite simple. Regardless of how good an enemy pilot might be, if he has no idea that he's about to get shot at, he's not really going to have any way of knowing that he's supposed to be taking evasive maneuvers, and by the time the twin long-barreled burst cannons on the DX-6 are firing, 
in all due likelihood, it'll be far too late. But of course, shooting at things isn't the only trick the drones are capable of. There are also shield drones, which are capable of projecting literal shield domes, capable of blocking even tank main weaponry fire, which is pretty goddamn impressive. Granted, these things are relatively rare, and only assigned to tower commanders, but even then, that is one hell of a shielding system to put on something so small, so mobile, and so compact. This suggests that the Tau Empire is getting very, very close indeed to rivaling the technological exploits of humanity during the Golden Age of Technology, which is pretty damn remarkable. But even for the Tau, building a full-on shield system is quite difficult. Usually they prefer utilizing shield relays with amplifier units and guardian drones, adding in multiple components to create a shield. This reduces the stress on each individual component and allows the shield to be more stable, more powerful, and longer lasting. But, of course, even this is pretty goddamn complicated. Far easier to simply make sure that whatever you are protecting is not going to be shot at in the first place than to actually cancel out the shot. To do this, the Tau have also developed the MV-5 Stealth Drone. These drones are usually used in pairs alongside the XV-95 Ghost Keel Stealth Battlesuit, and operate alongside it to create a cloaking field around both themselves and the battlesuit. And speaking of the XV-95 Ghost Keel, this is another little interesting example. It is said that Ghost Keel pilots form a particularly strong bond with their stealth droids whilst on extended deployment behind enemy lines. This seems to once again suggest that the anthropomorphizing idea is correct. Essentially, they're alone, they don't really have anybody to talk to, and they can't really use their long-range communication willy-nilly since that shit can be detected far easier than the actual battle suit. In return, they might start anthropomorphizing their drones even more than usual, essentially in an attempt to keep themselves sane by, well, simulating a relationship with this wonderful little dead hunk of metal hovering around their heads making kawaii little beeping noises and keeping them safe. Which makes me think that perhaps one of the best ways of actually discovering a ghost kill battle suit is to listen out for rhythmic sounds of flesh banging against metal. Hmm, just a thought. Moving swiftly along, the best defense is often a good offense, which is why drones are also occasionally used defensively as sentry guns, both as sentry turrets armed with a wide array of various weaponries, burst cannons, multiple banks of pulse carbines, missile launchers, etc., and also as tactical support turrets. These are usually deployed via dropships and are seeded around an engagement zone, and essentially act as light supporting artillery, either with missile pods or with seeker missile pods. In the latter case, they will wait for the Tau to activate their marker lights, find a target, and then utilize the marker light to guide the seeker missile to the target. And finally, of course, we're talking about the logistical and communicative roles of the drones. They are utilized both by Earthcast and Aircast personnel to transport and build on-site structures. Now, the Tau are not particularly fond of any kind of fixed base when they're operating inside enemy territory, preferring of course to utilize their hit-and-run tactics, but unfortunately the Tau are not the only ones able to learn from their mistakes, and their various enemies are starting to realize that even the Tau's mechanized spearheads, formidable and maneuverable as they are, will eventually run out of resources and require supply depots. Therefore, they have started plastering slash besieging anything and everything that might remotely look like a point of supply, say for example, civilian population centers. This has led the town to realize the value of establishing hidden caches of supply in unexpected places. And seeing as they've already got cadres of drones being able to do most of the work, all that's really required is a handful of Earthcast engineers to create full-on supply depots, with then perhaps a few aircast transports to ferry in the supplies. In prolonged engagements, which, mind you, is something that the Tau wish to avoid at pretty much any cost, 
they might also have to establish full-on maintenance centers. Since of course town technology is extraordinarily complex, and anything that is extraordinarily complex is also going to require extraordinarily complicated and frequent maintenance. And then there's the communication aspect. The Tau are of course able to utilize a long range radio communication like pretty much all of the other races, but the problem with such communication is that it can be listened in on, it can be intercepted, and it can also be interfered with. On the other hand, the benefits is that it has considerably longer range than say for example optical means of communication. This is where the drones once again comes in. If you want to be communicating with somebody that is over the horizon, meaning that you usually could not use a form of optical communication like for example laser communication, all you need to do is to have a few communications drones. Have one at the point you wish to send the signal to, have one on the point of the horizon, and have one with the guy trying to send the signal. And voila, you have created a laser communication relay system that can move at a split second's notice, and can zip and zoom across the terrain without any further guidance by Tau personnel. Add in more drones and you massively extend the range of this communication system. It could also be used to cross particularly unfortunate terrain that might otherwise block optical communication. And since this form of communication is extraordinarily difficult to interfere with, and practically impossible to hack or listen in on, it is probably the safest way for Tau Hunter Cadres to communicate with one another. They can also be used for a slightly different form of communication, namely spying. I mean, it's, it's communication, just not um, quite as out in the open, shall we say. And hell, this has far from been an exhaustive list of all of the roles that the drones take on in Tau society. As I mentioned previously, they do practically everything. They wash windows, they watch actual pets, hell, they're even riding platforms for the ethereals, and I'm sure they also cook food and herd cattle. There's basically nothing that they don't do. And now, to wrap it up a bit, let's get back to the idea of machine learning. You know, how stupid these things actually are, because a lot of the things they're doing sound relatively rudimentary. You know, fire your weapons in that general direction, or go over there to relay an optical signal, or stay still while I sit on top of you in the case of the ethereals using them as riding platforms. A lot of this sounds fairly simple, fairly rudimentary. But you'd be surprised just how complex these things are, because remember, once again, these aren't living creatures, they have no intelligence, they are just machines, and machines are extraordinarily dumb. For example, machines have a very hard time differentiating between, well, anything and everything, basically. Let's take the example of the Tau gun drone, or more precisely the sentry drone, for example, and compare that to something we actually try to develop in real life. There was, for example, an automated sentry system that was in testing by various military forces, including one developed by a Norwegian company which I may or may not, neither confirming nor denying, any involvement in. And now that that's out of the way, this system was essentially a very large camera with one hell of a zoom function on it mounted atop a very large machine gun. The basic idea was that if anything approached the camp giving off a thermal signature and not constantly strobing an IFF signal, that being identify friend foe, the machine gun would take issue with this breach of base integrity and proceed to swiftly and conclusively remove the uh, threat. And the system seemed to be very promising. It could easily pick up and identify IFF signals even through considerable interference, and it could engage targets with remarkable accuracy at downright astonishing ranges, so they decided to put it in some limited field testing. And this is when the first problem arrived. Remember when I said that machines are remarkably stupid? Well, one of those idiot elements is that it is only able to do the precise thing it has actually been told to do, and any deviation from that precise thing will cause all manners of interesting and fascinating consequences that can often be surprisingly difficult to predict, regardless of how obvious they might at first seem. 
In this case, the robot had been told to look for certain IFF signals, identify them, and then not empty its ammo container into said IFF signal. That, by the way, was another problem. The machine had no way of understanding when what it was shooting at was considered dead, and so it simply continued to make very, very, very sure until it finally ran out of ammunition. But hey, that was a fairly simple problem to solve, so no major worries there. And the second main task was to look out for heat signatures. If a large enough heat signature crossed a certain line, an invisible line, by the way, uh, which could in and of itself be a small problem, then the machine gun attached to the camera would make sure that that was the last mistake said heat signature ever made. The problem was that to the retarded brain of the robot, the heat signature of a rabbit or dog or sheep looked more or less exactly the same as a terrorist armed with an RPG, and so it somewhat indiscriminately took care of any and all problems that might stray across the warning lines. And, well, let's just say that certain life forms have more trouble reading a warning, don't come closer sign, than others. And this led to a rather rapid and entirely man made depopulation of the local wildlife. Now, of course, this was a relatively early prototype, and many of these minor bugs, bugs bunnies in this case, can certainly be sorted out over time, and of course, advances in this field are also made. But nevertheless, it serves as a good example on just how dumb machines are. They can do the exact thing you have taught them to do, and only that exact thing. It is not capable of any kind of nuance or variables beyond that precise thing, unless you also program in those nuances and variables as other precise things. And this is where the Tau drones are so unique. You see, they are able to adjust themselves quite well, actually, to pretty much any circumstances. For example, they are able to operate in a sort of hive mind unity for short periods of time, where they are able to traverse landscapes, find targets, and react accordingly, without any further input from an operator. However, if they are operating individually, they lose the ability to link their AIs together and increase their processing power. This means that a single drone might require feedback from an operator far more often, but even then it is able to hover, able to avoid terrain, able to fire at foes, able to not fire at friendlies, and carry out several basic tasks. This is either an extraordinarily complex and advanced script, or a genuine artificial intelligence. Which, well, there are certain issues with AI in 40k, but, well, we'll get to that some other time. And in the case of the Tau drones, they are artificial intelligences, because it is mentioned specifically that Tau commanders with a drone interface link is able to give them commands that are outside of their usual programming. In other words, the drone is actually able to recognize and understand a command that it has not specifically been programmed to understand. And that would of course be the difference between a scripted AI, a quote-unquote AI and an actual artificial intelligence, which, by the way, let me quickly explain and oversimplify the difference just in case you're wondering. Let's start with the scripting example by using a fairly simple robotic program. Let's say that I've got a robot arm. I want the robot arm to go over to a certain position and pick up an item at that position, then move it to yet another position. Okay, this is a fairly simple program. I tell the robot arm where it is currently, because it needs that information to figure out where it's going. Then I tell it to go to point A, which is where the item I wanted to pick up is. Then I tell it to activate a tool, let's for example say a suction cup, to grip the item. Okay, now it's got the item picked up. Now I will tell it to go from the position it is currently in to position B where it will then deactivate the tool, in this case again a suction cup, thereby dropping the item. And again, this is massively oversimplified compared to what you would actually need to write to carry out even this very, very simple task. And it's also assuming that there's nothing in the robot's way that you need to tell it to go around, or that the robot doesn't misunderstand the input. You'd be surprised how often a robot decides that the shortest way to a certain point is not actually the shortest way to a certain point. Working with multi-jointed robot arms is 
an interesting, although testing, experience. Now, the other example, if this robot arm had actual AI, a real artificial intelligence capable of interpreting my orders, I could simply tell it, go and pick up that piece. And the AI would figure out what I meant by that piece and pick it up. And so it would, by itself, without any further input from me, move over to the correct point, activate the tool to pick up the piece, and then drop it off wherever I wanted to drop it off. In that case, my only input is, go pick that up and place it over there. And that's literally all I did. There's no script writing involved, there's no programming involved, because the artificial intelligence has already been programmed to such a degree that it is capable of understanding this order without, mind you, and this is the important part, being programmed specifically to accept and interpret that and only that order. In other words, the key difference is the ability to reason. A robot can only do what it has been programmed and told specifically to do, whilst the artificial intelligence, a true artificial intelligence, would be able to make logical inferences to reason based upon the information it has available to it, much like the human brain is able to. And for reference, we have, at the moment, not been able to create anything even remotely close to that. The most advanced AI, quote-unquote AIs, in the world would be Honda's Asimo and Boston Dynamics Atlas. We'll use the Atlas for the example because it's the one that looks closest to being able to reason as far as we'd understand. The Atlas's primary directive, to oversimplify again, is basically to keep its balance and remain standing since it is a bipedal robot. It does this by having tons and tons of various sensor inputs that tells it precisely where it is in the room at any given time. This means that if you were to push it, it would then get all of the data it has constantly flowing into it to determine that, okay, I have been pushed, I am tilting by so and so many degrees, so and so much force has been applied to me, therefore I need to do this and this to regain my balance. And that might at first sound like reasoning, but it is not. It is a very, very cool and rather advanced trick. The same trick that is used to simulate a artificial intelligence opponent in a strategy game. It is a very long and extraordinarily complex series of programming, or scripts, to again oversimplify it a little bit, that tells the robot exactly what to do when it is exposed to certain things. In other words, when its senses is saying this and this, it needs to react by doing that and that. It's not reasoning, it's just a super fucking cool script. And hopefully, that will give you some idea of just how advanced the Tau drones really are, because they are pretty goddamn incredible. And, well, we know what happens with artificial intelligences in 40k, don't we? And yet, the Tau are still alive. Hmm. Well, that'll be that spicy subject for a future video I told you about. Uh, don't worry, I'm planning to do this one relatively soon. I won't make you wait until, well, maybe next year. But hey, details, it'll be soon by my standards. Until then, I've been Arch. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.